Welcome to Feminine Roadmap Podcast. I'm your host, Gina Farrar. Each week, I bring you an inspiring conversation to help you navigate the challenges and changes of midlife so that you can not only survive, but thrive in your second half. Hello, Feminine Roadmappers. It is Gina here, and today we have a fun topic. We are going to be talking about creative writing as therapy. My guest today is Diane Sherry Case. She believes that art saves lives, and she encourages people to practice daily creativity for at least 10 minutes a day to help relieve stress and to help them emotionally and physically. Now, Diane is a Renaissance woman. She's an actress, a director, a writer, a painter, and more. And she's the author of Write for Recovery, Exercises for Heart, Mind, and Spirit. So for this podcast, if you're not driving, please grab a pen and paper because she's going to be sharing some creative prompts. Diane, thank you so much for saying yes and being on my show today. Oh, it's a pleasure. Wonderful. Well, let's talk about what it is that led you to this mission and this message as art for therapy. Well, it's really a long story. I was a child actor and um, in my teens and early 20s, I was really a wreck, like a lot of drugs and rock and roll and it was glamorous, but it was dangerous. And I found an acting coach and got into acting as a craft that I loved. And I know it just, you know, turned my life around. And I've seen, I've taught in prisons. I teach homeless youth now, and I teach all sorts of people. But I learned, especially like, I just seen it transform people's lives and them process things that they wouldn't ordinarily process. The process I teach is to, when you're writing to not worry about grammar or punctuation or spelling so that you write as fast as you can you let the pen lead so you're not you're bypassing the intellect and in that way you tend to channel or get to deeper levels of yourself depending on how you like to look at it i kind of feel like i'm a channel sometimes both painting and writing And then you surprise yourself. Like, I'm always surprised by what I write. I I think, God, I didn't think of that. And I also get to the next step. Like, when I'm upset, I can get to the next level, get some of that out of the way, instead of being stuck in it. And when I paint, I analyze the paintings after I've painted them. And that's really exciting. It's like they're not planned. It's so fun because before we hit record, you and I were sharing our artwork with each other and I had just had a technologically challenging weekend and I had painted three paintings, one before the technology challenge, one right after the technology challenge, and then one after I overcame it and finished the task the second time. And we were discussing how different the colors and the movement are based on your emotions. And so I hear you talking about people not thinking while they write and the way that I have to look at it is not judging, like not editing myself. Exactly. As I go, right. Mm-hmm. No self editing allowed. It's, it's really a practice of letting it flow out. Cause I agree with you. I recently did a writing exercise. I don't know my biological father, but he is still alive. And um, I recently found out where he is and I'm not pursuing it, but I wanted to write a letter. It just came to me after watching something that I should write a letter to him. He'll never see it. But I just started writing and I wrote like four pages of things I would say. And the prompt I used was like, Mm -hmm. what would I say to him if I saw him? And it was really good because when I got to the end, because it ended like, it's like you run out of things sometimes, you know, you get there and you're like, Uh I think I've said what I need to say. I went back once, but I found that to be a really great way to declutter that emotional space that I, I was fairly clear. It wasn't like I was angry or anything, but it like did this extra level. Like you said, it kind of takes you to a place of peace. Is, is that what you find with people? Absolutely. It takes you, it helps me make decisions. It helps me know myself better. It helps me see patterns when I journal. 
that, you know, oh dear, I've been moaning over that for a year. <laughs> There's also another, I suggest this when people are grieving. I don't know if it works in your situation, but to have, perhaps you'd want to write a letter from your father to yourself. Mm -hmm. Maybe from your ideal father to yourself so that you can um, give yourself the nurturing that you didn't get the fatherly masculine and give it to yourself. That's a bit like inner child work, isn't it? Yeah, I suppose so. Mm. Yeah. Interesting. Now you do Zoom classes, right? So people who want to be kind of tutored or mentored along this line, how do those work? Oh, they're fantastic. I just did a really long one for an organization here for a benefit, a four hour one, but I don't usually do that. They're usually two hours. Um, and uh, I keep it down to like eight people, eight to 12 max. And we write, I give prompts. And then if you like, you can share what you wrote. Uh, it's pretty raw. People can use it, people, non writers as well as writers. They can use it to generate material for a memoir or a novel. They can use the exercises as fiction or as they're writing about their life. So they can write about a character's life or their own, depending on how deep they want to go with it psychologically and what kind of mood they're in. It's interesting with writing, isn't it? Because authors do tend to write themselves and the people that they know into their characters, right? So there's a way of um, secretly, you know, <laughs> expressing uh -huh. things through fiction writing. Right? Yeah, like sometimes I'll have you break up, write three characters that are within you, mm. three parts of yourself, and give them names and have them have dialogues. <laughs> because they're doing it anyway, right? Exactly. I have a painting that's like four heads, and I call it the committee in my mind. You know, let's talk about why, if we can it's creativity works the way it does. Why does it give us that freedom? How, how does it become that conduit to healing? I think there's a couple of things. One, I always say, if you don't use your imagination, it will use you. We all have imaginations. And if you can channel it into an art, you're more in control of it than if it's abusing you with fear and anger and rumination. So to get it out is just vital. It's so important uh, to take you to the next step of whatever. It's freeing. I was just wondering why or how creativity becomes therapy. What is it about creativity that makes it therapy? I think it's also because it, it it takes you from your left brain, which is the logical, reasonable part of you, which I'm uncomfortable being in, frankly, to more right brain activity and balances that out. So you have both of that in your life. Otherwise, if you're always in the lawyer mode or logic or, you know, reason, all that, it's not as playful. Art's playful. It's childlike in a way. I feel like art allows you to tap into maybe art in writing, art in painting, art in drawing, any kind of creativity kind of helps you reconnect with parts of yourself that might have been kind of blocked off or shut off. Exactly. You know, we've kind of segmented ourselves somehow emotionally or mentally. I think it's a good way to reconnect yourself. Exactly. And it, it also makes you, helps you make sense of your life and the stories in your life and the trajectory. I teach both creative, you know, just for fun writing and therapeutic writing. And therapeutic writing taps into, it brings up a lot of things that it makes therapy work faster because it brings up a lot of things that if you're in therapy, you can take to your therapist. It just helps you process things and get to the other side of them. My sister-in-law right now is doing brain dump art. I don't know if you've heard of it. So she draws a design, decides the colors, and then she literally writes either a phrase over and over just on top of itself. And it creates a picture. Nice. Sometimes she has it pre-drawn. Sometimes she just starts writing. And so she has several colored pens. And the art is really expressive. 
and she's using it to work through stress and anxiety, actually. I'd love to see that. It's super effective for her. And so lately, of course, it's one of those things where you and I were going to talk. So all these cool things kind of came my way. And let's talk about art. Art can be very intimidating for some people, can't it? Yes. And that's why prompts help because I have never had a person in any of my workshops in 12 years that had trouble writing because I give fun prompts and they just click. It's not like staring at a blank page. I also, you mentioned that she repeats things. When I tell people to flow write, if they get stuck, not to go to thinking, but instead write the same word over and over and over or the same phrase until another one comes out because it will. And all of these things can be rough drafts for something you want to write later. So you can edit it later. But sometimes in poetry or fiction, repetition is a rhythm and an art. It works. It can make the poem better. So that's a helpful um, way to keep flow writing. But if you have a simple prompt, like I have one where you write down five to seven of your favorite one syllable words that make you feel good, like wild or sea, I mean sea as an ocean or wind or rose. And so you write those words first. So that's easy. Anybody can do that. And then you write either a paragraph or a poem or a little story of all one syllable words. So you've got to start you have already started because you've got seven words you can use and it makes it easy to write a little piece. Every word's a one syllable in the poem? Yeah, it's just a fun prompt. In my journey of creativity, I have found that if I'm emotionally constipated, I resist being creative. It's like the thing that's best for you is the thing you're least approaching. You know, it's the thing you're doing the least amount of. So it's, I think there's this overcoming self-judgment in the creative process. Mm -hmm. Like yielding to it and letting it be whatever it's going to be. You can just do it for yourself. And I also recommend 10 minutes a day because that's not intimidating. Even five is helpful. It's not intimidating. Anybody can do that. And it often turns in, it's sneaky because it often turns into an hour or two. If you show up every day for 10 minutes, the muse will eventually be there. If you're not showing up with your pen or your paintbrush and the muse comes, it's gone. You've lost it. It's like the algorithms on Facebook. You know, if you show up every day, you know, it's great if it's the first thing in the morning or the last thing at night, so it knows that it's going to happen at a certain time, then the muse will start meeting you there. Would you agree that you don't even have to know where you're headed, that it's a little bit of a blind journey? Absolutely. I think that's the most fun part of it. I never plan my writing or my paintings. And my novels are like jigsaw puzzles. I write what I want to write for fun, and then I try to jigsaw them together into a novel. (laughs) Then I find what works. You know, I I could never do an outline. That would be just no fun for me. That's a, a logical approach. And that's just not my approach because I like to be surprised and I like to learn things about my internal life that I'm not aware of consciously. You said you like to allow yourself to be surprised. That's a great tip, actually. Letting go of control. Mm -hmm. Does it feel like... Mm. It feels childlike and like playful. Yeah, it's an open... Your channel gets more and more open. It really does help to have prompts. A really good one for right now A friend of mine, uh, my mentor, a man named Jim Crusoe, gave it to a friend of mine who wrote his first short story, gotten the best American short stories from this prompt, which was amazing. But it's just a person alone in a room with a plant. And you can go wild with that. He, I think his plant overgrew the room. Your plant can start talking. You can go anywhere with it. And the wilder, the better. Just see what happens when you imagine, describe the room, describe the plant, 
describe the person. I always say use all your senses when you're writing. Use hearing and smelling and feeling, tactile, of course, seeing and tasting. And that makes it richer and more vivid for you. When you're working with underserved people, whether they're emotionally challenged or their lives have been very hard, like you said, I think you said you work with children, homeless youth. youth. What do you find happens when you introduce them to creativity? Are they able to find it or is it a journey of them finding that childhood? I sometimes I cry on my way home from work when I teach them because they get such joy out of it. And I've developed such close relationships with them. They just take to it like a fish to water. So many of them just eat it up. And talent, frankly, is common. We think talent is rare, but literary talent, I know for sure, is really common. Because I've, you know, I've taught so many people that weren't writers that turned out to write beautiful things by accident without planning it. You know, when you said talent is common, the thing that came to mind was that it might be common, but so many of us don't ever go there. Yeah. What a tragedy that is to waste your talents. And it's an affront to any God you believe in because they are gifts. And I don't know what I would have done during this isolation if I didn't paint and write and have Zoom to connect. But I'm just so grateful that I have talents to keep me entertained. I, I haven't had a hard time with it at all because I'm busy painting and writing and teaching. I think for me, having done so much art over the weekend, over the last uh, four or five days, actually, what I did was I painted two of them mostly with my left hand and I'm right-handed. And I did that because I didn't want to put pressure on myself. I wanted to just see what would happen, like you said. And I ended up really loving the paintings. And I did three and they're very different from each other in color, in mood. And I think color, let's talk about that. How color can be such a great conduit for expression. Oh, yes. You're feeling calm or you're feeling frustrated because the one that I painted after I lost my entire edit after seven hours of work was much more vibrant, right? Much more intense. Uh Let's talk about the use of color and creativity to help people relieve stress. I'm mainly, you know, my focus is mainly on writing, even though I paint, but there's different kinds of language There's different colors in language. There's a list of sad words and a list of words that make you feel hopeful. I like lists because they're also easy to write, you know, for non-writers especially. And they can turn into poems. But, you know, uh, words have their colors. They have different moods and different emotions. That is so true because you think about, I'm feeling blue. Yeah, exactly. Their brightest sunshine. Uh huh. So maybe you could take a color and then connect it to emotions, possibly? That's a great idea. You could do uh, write a list of your favorite colors and then write how they make you feel. Mm. Or write a story that's predominantly, that that color plays a predominant role in. Haikus are also kind of fun because they're kind of easy. Uh, You just have to do the uh, five, seven, five syllables, and it's quick. You can do it in your 10 minutes. There's a little bit of a fallacy about poetry that it always has to rhyme, and I think that hitches people up. Yeah, I don't don't like poetry that rhymes, (laughs) generally. So that's interesting. I know that we, you and I talked about painting. So I think writing is painting with words, though, is it not? Yes. In a sense, it really is. Yeah, using all your senses when you write is really important because, oh, I was going to say to write, and especially in haikus, they're usually what makes them beautiful is they have an image. And that's another thing that makes it out of the intellect and into uh, something else. You you create an image of a flower, you know, you describe it or an image of a mountain rather than, you know, I feel blue 
you can picture a lonely mountain or a lone mountain in a prairie or, you know, I'm just off the top of my head. So in rather than just say what you're feeling, you project it, you, you use an image to describe what you're feeling. Mm. Does it kind of help you when you do something like that and you use an image instead of I feel? Does it kind of do what talking about something in third person does where it separates it enough that you can give it space to kind of grow? Is that kind of what happens? Yeah, that's a, that's a good way to put it. It also makes it more lit- beautiful, literary. Oh, I know what I was going to say. I have a journal writing technique that I suggest, and that is to write in your journal in the third person. It's just a fun trick, and it gives you a more objective point of view, takes you outside of yourself, like she went to the market and yelled at the clerk because she was hurt that her boyfriend had yelled at her. You know what I mean? Whatever. But rather than I did this, and then you're not feeling like you're in self-pity and (laughs) wallowing in the emotions. You're more objective and can, like, look at it clearly. I think it is good as you're talking, thinking, you know, if you could, when you've had an emotional experience, whether it's really positive or or negative or whatever, to just have a place where you can write down or scribble or just physically move that emotion through your hand to the pen, to the paper. It doesn't have to be organized, right? It just needs to flow out. You can just write down series of words and phrases. You know, and then later you can turn them into something, but just like furiously go for it. I think of like not having an obligation to end up with a beautiful collected piece of something, but really allowing it to be more like a river, right? Uh Just just let it be what it is. And in a few months, you will have a beautiful piece of writing somewhere that you can edit and I mean, a few months or a few days, it, it happens, but that's not your goal. Your goal is to write as if you were going to burn it. Mm. Let's talk about that. What if people are afraid someone will see it and so that they don't, they're not completely honest because they're afraid of that. Yeah. I used to have one of those little lock diaries when I was a child, I guess that ages me, but, uh, Yeah, it's just totally off limits. I lock my writing in my computer. You can put a lock on it, a word, password. So, yeah. I prefer writing with my hand because Mm -hmm. it does something with the brain. I agree. And that's what I request of my people to do it by hand. But I, I tend to be on the computer doing other things. So I go back to my journal and my computer, but writing by hand is very valuable. And I don't know what to say, just hide it well. And, you know, if you're not, if you're living with somebody that doesn't respect your boundaries, you know, make it clear that that's a boundary. And maybe you should look at that if somebody would go through your diary, you know. That's a really good point. That made me kind of think if you're in a situation where you don't feel like you have a voice or you're not able to express yourself writing could be the place where you find that voice kind of declutter that situation or that relationship so that you can actually address it in real life with more clarity wouldn't you think Absolutely. And I love, I love your use of the word declutter because journal writing, the first step is to just, you know, blah, get it all out. And in terms of relationships, I use dialogues a lot. Like you can write a dialogue with yourself, making a decision. You can write a dialogue with the person, you know, practicing what you'd like to say and and you get to more clearly the message that you want to go for. And I was taught to do word sandwiches. When you have a conflict with somebody, you say something nice to them. Then you tell them your what happened and your problem with it, what you want from them, and then something nice again. And I also do that in critiquing writing. You say what you like about it first, then you say what could be better. And then I don't even do that when I teach writing in this because it's, it's more for fun and therapy. And then, you know, 
and say what you like about it. There's a tool called emotional brain training, and it's another guest that I got to know and became friends with. And they have a process. A lot. Yeah, I learned a lot. It's been a real blessing. But it, it connects with what you just said. So there's a when they share their journey of that using the tool, processing through something frustrating, at the end she has a very specific prompt that you use to give a message back and it has certain parameters. And learning that practice kind of taught me how to to be more specific, not to cross any boundaries, right? She says, don't Mm -hmm. become parental, don't become enabling, just, she talks about how, how it affects you physically in your body. And that's what made me think about what you're talking about. When we are expressing ourselves in writing or in art or whatever, there is that greater impact because our memories and our emotions are in our body. They're not just in our mind. They're literally scattered throughout our body. And so it would be good to have a little bit of a space for yourself. Exactly. And you know what another fun writing exercise is? Is to write from a part of your body as if it's speaking, like from your broken elbow or from, you know, just any part of your body. If you want to use it with a sense of humor, my an exercise I was given was write a conversation with your big toe. <laughs> Or you can write from the point of view of your big toe. But you can either use that as, you know, a therapeutic thing with some injury or some, you know, your heart hurts or you've got a knot in your throat. Or you can do it for fun and to be silly. I love the idea of if you feel like you have a broken heart, speaking from your heart's point of view, that Uh might be a really raw but very, what is the word I'm looking for? Like, it must allow the burden to shift, you know, because you're expressing it, you're giving the heartbreak a voice instead of, Mm -hmm. I feel it. It's like you're talking about this thing, but if the heartbreak is speaking, Mm -hmm. there's a deeper expression to that. That's interesting. It's deeper. And at the same time, it's a little more detached because you're, uh, it's observing. So when it's using that part of your mind, you know, that's what's unique about human beings is they can think about, you know, they can observe themselves feeling, observe themselves thinking. I don't like thinking, but you can observe how your body feels. Mm-hmm. You don't have to just be in it and be in the pain of the heartbreak and you can observe it as well. You can express it and, and observe it. Sounds like a good poem too, writing from the point of view of your heart. And the journey that it's been on, that really seems like it would be really cool, doesn't it? Yeah. Be an interesting to do a history of your heart. Another one I like, a funner one, is the the soundtrack of your life. You do a list of, of songs that represent different periods of your life. And I did, you know, I was listening to songs the other day from my 20s, Cat Stevens and different people, and uh, I started crying. And But it was not this sobbing, awful crying. It was like this gently, it was reminiscing, it was nostalgic, it was grieving for getting older, for times lost, for years that I lost, being a mess, and It just was just full of all sorts of things. And I just let tears flow. You know, it doesn't have to be painful. It was actually a weirdly pleasant experience. And that just came from listening. I maybe it came from I had done the soundtrack of my life in in writing. You know, when we lean into the emotion, it's so healthy sometimes, you know, if we give it expression, right? If it and allow it. it. Mm Mm-hmm. Instead of fighting it and trying to say, you know, I shouldn't feel this or or judging it. This is horrible. I hate this emotion. Those are things that have to be removed in order to really express, though. The shoulds, shooting all over ourselves. Um, (laughs) You know, just Uh being so harsh with ourselves. Yeah, and we are. Maybe that is a good way to deal with our inner mean girl. 
maybe Ooh. we write something to the inner mean girl or write a instead conversation of, with her yeah instead of being one with the mean girl maybe we need to push her out a little bit and yeah write letters back and forth between you and her hmm. there are all sorts of things you can do dialogues hmm. i love that write dialogue letters it's it's a way of journaling where if you can't figure out what to say right let's uh -huh. talk about that if somebody has really never journaled and they'd like to, or they don't really understand what the point is, you know, cause some people they're like, well, why would I do that? Let's talk about the benefit of journaling and how you would start. I know we've, we've given different things, but if someone, you said to someone, I want you to write in this journal, give me some tools that a person who is either intimidated by it or doesn't understand the power of it. What would you say to that person? pen and blank paper, a book with nothing written in it, how do they start and become fluent in that language, if you will? Well, first, I wanted to address your question about how it's helpful. And I wrote the first chapter of my book is a little academic. The rest of it's real easy reading. But I wrote about therapeutic writing and expressive writing and the history of it and all the studies that have been done, even with people with cancer, about how it it even helps you physically, but it definitely has been shown to help enhance your life. And the way to get started is just to, you know, I don't want to use a ugly words like vomit, <laughs> but just let it all, you know, write exactly what's going on. You can start, if it's easier to start with physically, I went to the market, I stubbed in my toe, ouch. Or you can write what you're feeling just to cleanse, just to get, you know, just write whatever goes through your head. It doesn't, it can be disjointed. It can be just phrases. It doesn't have to be sentences. It doesn't have to make sense. You can write images if you want. If you don't feel like writing what you're feeling, you can write about the rain. It's raining here. And what does that remind you of? Anything that's in your head, in your environment, in your body, any of those exercises I gave are prompts to get started. Do you ever encourage people to use voice memos if that's a way to kind of start the conversation? Because I know some people in my life use voice memos, like if they're with their phone and this emotion comes through or an idea comes through, they record it. Then they'll That's go a back. good idea. I don't use that enough. I, I use notes in my phone because if you, sometimes you have an idea and you'll, you'll, it's such a good idea. You'll, you know, you'll remember it. And then that night you don't remember it. <laughs> <laughs> and the same thing with dreams, you know, you have an image and you know, you'll remember that dream. And the more you write your dreams, if you remember just a little teeny bit of the dream, then the next, you know, and the more you write them, the more you remember them that kind of snowballs and that's fun too. That's a way to start writing. If you have, if you remember dreams, I write from art. I use art as inspiration, like a painting that I like. And I'll write first what I see, what's in the moment, what's happening in the moment of the painting. Then I go on to write what happened before the painting, that moment. And then what happened after the moment in the painting. So you end up with a story with a beginning, middle, and end. That's a kind of advanced little thing. But art can inspire just to sit down and write what you see in a piece of art. Because it usually contains feeling and emotion. Because that's why painters paint. Right this moment, I had this visual. So painters paint, writers write, dancers dance. But it's all the same thing just uh, expressed differently there is a thing from an old book it's uh birds gotta fly tiger's gotta eat man's gotta sit and wonder why 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 i can't remember that one <laughs> anyway it was a fun, it reminded me of that you know yes we need to do what our souls were meant to do we were born with talents all of us in Bali, I was really impressed. I went there when I was about 29 and uh, before it was really a big touristy, but everybody in the culture makes art. It's part of their religion. So it's a spiritual practice. And it's not like 
reserved for special people. Everybody does it. And I'd like to see that in our culture. That's a great idea, just because in expressing ourselves in whichever way, whether it's painting, drawing, writing, music. we're honoring a part of ourselves. Yes, music. We're honoring a part of ourselves that isn't being expressed, right? And, and I mm-hmm. think back to that river analogy, we have these rocks in our mind and hearts that they're blocking our emotions, which is the flow. If we could just, you know, express certain things and not feel shame or guilt over it, letting it come out. For me, I'm just going to be honest, Diane, I am an expressive person and I orally process, which is a good and bad thing. What I have to do if I'm safe with someone is say, okay, I'm just going to say it. It's probably not going to come out right but can I just dump it out and then we can work through what I actually mean. And so I think that's what writing can be. It can be dumping it out first and you can detangle it or leave it alone. Right. Mm -hmm. And it's especially useful in relationships because you, and then you're not fumbling and saying the stuff that is destructive. If you kind of explore it in writing ahead of time, the conversation. Mm. So if you have a, a sense that conflict is coming, take to the paper first, have, have the battle on paper. Yes, absolutely. (laughs) Well, my savior. Get out all the anger first and then you can get to the hurt and then you can get to the solution. Hmm. What you really want, what you need from the other person. You know, I've had this analogy um, that I've used in my teaching over the years and it's so vivid. I love pictures, word pictures. So I say our thoughts are birds and our mind is a cage, right? And if you let birds out of a cage, it creates chaos. There's feathers and poop everywhere. It's just nonsense. So we have to take our thoughts captive and keep them in the cage. And I think if we've never taken the time to express them through like writing, like you're talking about, I feel uh-huh. like our brains are basically full of frantic birds that are just crappy. <laughs> you know exactly that's how it exactly. feels yeah and they want to fly and they might land on your shoulder and be your friend <laughs> but you have to know where they're coming from instead of just uh-huh. letting them bounce around so for me the oral processing piece it declutters my mind i have to work it through physically that's my way some people that's why I was wondering if voice memos might work for someone initially. If, uh-huh. if you find it easier to talk it through, you could talk it through on a voice memo and then maybe transcribe it later. Or it's just an, another tool that could potentially be helpful for someone like me who likes to talk. Or well, just use the voice memo for to remind you of a subject that you want to write about later or explore in depth or as a prompt later. What's your all-time favorite kind of situational prompt? What do you find is one of the most meaningful prompts that you use to teach people? I don't know. I think letters are really valuable. Lists are really easy and valuable. I, I take prompts from creative writing field, which you can find all sorts of them online. And I adapt them and design them to be therapeutic which I use sometimes my all time favorite prompt. That's really a hard one. I don't know if I can, I can, I guess I should put it more broadly. So if you were to say, you know, maybe it is the lists, maybe it is the letters. What have you found has been a really great way to draw a group of people out into that therapy writing provides. I give them a free association, but that, that needs me to do. (laughs) I give them free association exercises. They're like union prompts. Like I give a word like car, remember your first or remember a car, remember a, so I guess you could do that for yourself, write a list of words and then write about them. Mm -hmm. Um, But the free association always surprises people. Um, one of the things, uh, one of the favorites that people usually read is write about an item in the house of your grandparent or other older relative. 
everybody has something, you know, that brings back a lot of memories. Uh, one of my favorite journal things, I have two favorite journal things. And one of them is really common. I'm sure you've heard it a thousand times, but is a gratitude list. And that's so valuable because, you know, even in the midst of this, we have things to be grateful for. And the other one is I have a thing called Savor the Moment. I think I got it from Sharon Salzberg, who's a meditation teacher, as a meditation and adapted it to writing. And that is to take a small moment in your day. It can be just when somebody let you in traffic or you smiled at the clerk or you heard a baby cry or a baby laugh. You had a moment with your dog and expand upon it in writing to savor it in writing. And when you do that daily, you start to notice the small moments in even the most negative day. There's always something that's pleasant, you know, or that makes you feel good. So it's good to look out for those moments because sometimes they're rare, but they happen. They are there using writing for mindfulness. Uh Uh-huh. Another really good thing, I really suggest people get outside these days now that we're isolated. We haven't talked much about being isolated, but take your journal with you and sit under a tree and write about the tree or write a conversation with the tree or write about the passersby and imagine their lives. I love to eavesdrop dialogue. (laughs) That's a good way to learn to write dialogue because it's different. Of course, we can't sit in restaurants in most places now, but you know, if you hear somebody passing, saying something, you can expand upon it and it can become a little story, even if you just heard one phrase. We've joked about, you know, well, Disneyland, we really miss Disneyland during this quarantine, but when you're sitting on a bench having your cup of coffee or tea, and people walk by and you catch the funniest pieces of what they're talking about. And they're so, I said to my family, <laughs> one time what we need to do is write down every snippet that we hear, uh-huh. make it a string of conversation. <laughs> That's a great idea. I went to my, my uh, youngest kid is getting her master's in um, poetry at NYU and they had their thesis readings online. And one of the writers took a line from each of the other writer's poems and made a poem. Oh. So you can also just make a collage of different things. You know, that's a way for a non-writer to get started. Make a collage of different things you see in the house. Just open a book, find a sentence, write it down. And some of them will go together and some of them won't. Some of them you'll cross out and some of them you'll go, wow, that's really fun. Have you seen that kind of art where people take old books, maybe they're rescued from the library, and they draw on the page, but they allow certain words to pop out? Ooh, that sounds great. Yeah, it's really cool. My girls have done it. Where oh, you know we might have, Yeah, we might have a book that isn't a great book, like it's just not a good story or something, and you just take the page and you craft something on the page and only allow certain phrases or words to pop out and you make a sentence on the page with the words that you allow to pop out. Fantastic. It's a lot of fun. Yeah, I do that with poetry. Like I'll give the kids a poem or the my students a poem and uh, have them pick, you know, their favorite words in the poem and then write something using those words or their favorite phrase. Words are powerful. They are. I mean, it's really interesting. I'm, I wish I knew more languages and I'm really interested in linguistics because your whole perception is different. Like I've heard that the Inuits have like 50 different words for the, what we call snow. So you could, you know, I mean, you have a whole different perspective if you have different, we can only kind of perceive what we have words for. Except for in art, which I think is a more holistic uh, thing than just words. I love how you said we can only perceive what we have words for. Mm -hmm. Because when you talk about writing as therapy, then 
the converse would be through writing, we begin to perceive better. If we can only perceive what we have words for, then in reverse, the words would lead to perception and understanding, right? Yeah, it's like what we were saying, writing from your heart. That's funny because I call my workshops right from the heart now. But uh, when you were talking about using your heart, then it gives your heart words. And giving your heart or your whatever you want to write from permission to have feelings is kind of an interesting thought. Uh-huh. Can, am I making sense? Like I'm processing. Absolutely. Totally. It's like, okay, we are taking a moment to pause and to hold a space for something in our life, whether it's, you know, a, something we see, something we hear, something we feel. And as we're recording this, and you've alluded to it several times, we're still in quarantine. Some places are opening up slowly, but we are still in that weird kind of place where some people aren't leaving home and some people have been very isolated. And that's why I thought this conversation would be helpful because even coming out of this, a lot of people feel stress and anxiety. So using a tool like this, Diane, what you offer, the workshops that you offer, people could tap into that and process what Mm -hmm. maybe they haven't processed yet and how they felt being on quarantine? Uh, I have a lot of exercises that are processing what we're going through. It's We're going through a lot of grief. It's like a societal grief of things we've lost. Uh, anger, sadness, fear. And then there are the good things that are happening, you know. Closets are being cleaned. <laughs> I also have a section on atmosphere that's a good thing to look at now. The atmosphere you live in and how you can make it more life affirming or enhance your life better. And this is a great time to transform your environment. You know, change the paintings around. Uh, Maybe you can order a colored light bulb or a nice smelling candle, just different things you can do to uh, change your environment. And to focus on things you can look forward to after this and the positive, both the positive things that can come out of this, which there are some, and what you can look forward to. And now is kind of a nice time to, after you've done the, I always like to do the negative stuff first and then go, after you got that out of your system, go to the positive. Write about your dream life. You know, write about your goals in the future. And, you know, realize that there is one. And that also uh, is very powerful. I didn't ever think, I never dreamed I would direct. And I always wanted to since I was a child. And I did this um, New Year's Day uh, workshop that had us write down our goals. And when I wrote down that I wanted within five years, and they said, just in your wildest dreams, what would you want to do? And I wrote down direct. And within three years, I was directing. So I think it's really powerful to write down your dream life and your goals. It's circling around to art as therapy. I think if someone hasn't taken the time to even give a voice to what their dream life would be, that alone could be therapy, right? Exactly. Exactly. Just describe your what you'd like a day to look like in five years. So let's talk a moment about your workshops and how people could get connected to those workshops. Um, My my website is writeforrecovery.com. Write as in scribbling, (laughs) not as in correct. And um, for is spelled out, writeforrecovery.com. And there, workshops are available there. I have a three-week workshop that's... uh, that you also get a private with private. I do privates by zoom as well. And um, then I have a six week workshop where people get to know each other a little better. Maybe community would be an easier way for some people because there's that encouragement. You're not alone with your principles or your thoughts, you know, that line from the movie, there he is alone with his principles. You know, we get too deep into our own head and we don't have an exit for that thought. Exactly. Be toxic, yeah? Yeah, it's really nice. I I love it. The beginning of the workshop is a lot different than the end because people have gotten a little closer by sharing 
you know, what they want to share. I don't ever require it or, you know, that's not the goal, but sometimes you want to, and it feels good and it connects you with people. Mm. Let me say something first. And that is I've been changing my, my workshops from right for recovery to right from the heart. So they're not coming from a place that you're necessarily in grief or trauma or addiction Mm -hmm. or something like that, because it's good for anybody. That's awesome. So why don't we land the plane and what are three things that people could anchor in after we've talked about so many ideas and the concept of writing as therapy? What are three things you really want them to hear after our time together? I want them to hear that if you don't use your imagination, it will use you. Your imagination is at work. It, it will think of negative things if you don't use it in an expressive way and that art saves lives. It, it will uplift your spirit and make your life more soulful and connect you with yourself. And I just really want to leave them with the suggestion and the hope that they will commit to 10 minutes a day, which may turn into longer and that's allowed. It may turn into all day. But 10 minutes a day is manageable. Anybody can do it to writing or any kind of creative, you know, painting, music, anything. And I promise that that will enhance your life. You look at songwriters, people who write films. It's all its own form of poetry, isn't it? Mm -hmm. It's expressing ourselves. It's expressing themselves. And so... Um, maybe we need to investigate a little which style works, like learning an instrument, writing your own lyrics, or journal writing, or the gratitude list. One practice that we use, and I've talked about it before on my podcast, is we have a jar. And when something happens that we want to remember, we spend the whole year filling the jar up with little strips of paper that are dated with the, the motion, the memory. It's really short. Fantastic. And then we read them on January 1st. That's fantastic. You don't necessarily have to read your own. We just pull them out and read them. And we, we basically savor the moments from the last year. That's fantastic. I love that idea. It's wonderful. This is our you can point. use those as prompts to expand upon in writing too. <gasps> great idea. That's a great idea. That also reminds me of a little practice that you have, uh, what you have, uh, a box. Some people call it their God box, where you put things you don't want anymore in. You write down feelings you don't, you want to let go of and put them in this little box and eventually get rid of it. I loved that. (laughs) That's really a great idea because again, you're letting go of. Yeah, you're setting it you're separating yourself from that thing instead of being that thing. Exactly. That's, that's powerful. Like saying I am, I am sad is, is harder to deal with than I have some sadness. It's not making you the, you know, totally embodying sadness. It's making it more temporary and passing. I have sadness right now because sometimes you're sad and you feel like that's, that's going to be always. Yeah. Yeah. And that back to your topic, you were saying, you know, writing is therapy. It does help you treat it like an object, if you will. Do you know what I mean? Like you can actually look at it now because it's not in your head anymore. It's on paper. So you can observe it as something Mm-hmm. And see and and allow it to have whatever impact it's going to have and just keep writing until you get to that point where it feels like you've tapped it out a bit yeah, yeah. exactly so yeah the workshops really help because uh, they help with for beginning writers to give them so they're not dealing with a blank page so they have really easy ways to get started and for more established writers i have a lot of people that are, you know, written books and stuff, it gives them material, generates material for what their, their memoirs or their novels. So those are really helpful and any kind of writing groups fun. Well, wonderful. Well, 
Diane, I want to thank you so much for being a part of my show today and for sharing the thing that you're so passionate about. I love all of the ideas and the creativity that you brought to the table today. I think it's going to be very impactful. So thank you for sharing with us. Oh, thank you for having me. It's been a pleasure to talk to you. Thank you. Today, I've been talking with Diane Sherry Case. She is a Renaissance woman who does writing workshops because she believes that creative writing is a great tool for therapy. She has written a book called Write for Recovery, Exercises for Heart, Mind, and Spirit. And if you head over to www.feminineroadmap.com forward slash episode 170, I will have links to Diane, her book, and her workshops. So if this is something you want to connect to, just head on over there and click those links. And while you're there, please leave your name and email address. I send out periodic emails. I'd love to have you as a part of my tribe. And there's a gift if you do. So friends, think about giving a little space in your life for expressing yourself, whether it's through writing or music or art, investigate it a little bit. I know in my own life, I have found it has been incredibly helpful. So please let us know how this conversation has impacted you and let us know the journey that it has taken you on. We would love to share in the joy of the freedom that this will bring. Thank you so much for joining us today, and we look forward to sharing more inspirational conversations and tools and resources with you in the future. Take care, my friends. Bye-bye. (laughs) Bye-bye.